Good morning. Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome to our Natural Health News live show. I hope this finds all of you healthy and happy after a wonderful Mother's Day break. I hope all of you mothers had a great Mother's Day. So welcome to our Monday Natural Health News live show. Today, I'm going to cover news about the coronavirus and COVID-19, some topics that I didn't report on yesterday, but want to definitely highlight this morning. And also today, I want to share with you four or herbs, herbs that naturally lower your inflammation levels. And so an underlying current with coronavirus and the severity of the virus as we're seeing, and I'll share with you some more reporting today, there's an undercurrent of an inflammatory condition. So an inflammatory disorder is part of why the virus is so overwhelming. So YouTube, it looks like our connection's not fabulous. So hopefully you all can hear me okay. It might buffer a lot. So uh, we'll just see how Monday morning on YouTube does. So today we're gonna talk about four herbs. A lot of these you might already have. Some of these you cook with are items that you can very easily grab from a grocery store. So they're not an overwhelming uh, complex sort of uh, supplementation. And then I'm also, I don't know, my mic's having some issues. I'm going to also share with you a kind of combo where you can grab it very easily from my store. So hopefully the mic, sorry, you guys. So this silk shirt's a little wonky for my mic. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody. I hope all of you mothers had a great mother's day. So comment down below if you had a wonderful day with your family. I disconnected. I literally didn't touch my phone for I think five or six hours, which is a serious feat in our household. And I finished reading a book. I sat outside in our hammock and sat in the sun all covered up. <laughs> it's, it's still a little chilly here. Um, but I hope, um, I hope all of you had a great day. I am drinking my kava relief, my, um, stress relief tea and the yogi teas always have a cute little message. It's hard to see on YouTube, but the little message is the principal ingredient of life is love. So I'm spreading and sharing love today with all of you. And, and actually, um, I have a little challenge for all of you, especially on Instagram. I posted um, our outdoor, just kind of the, when you go on the left side, right below where the doorbell is, we have a note and we have a whole bunch of items for our delivery workers. So we put out snacks. I have some hand sanitizers, little uh, trials like this that I give away. Um, and then also I have some gloves and masks and, and, and uh, wet wipes. But I'm encouraging all of you, if you are having delivery workers, even your uh, postal service workers, I'm challenging everybody to love them this week because our essential workers that are making deliveries, they are the front line. And um, it's something, it's really minor, but really makes them happy. And we have several of that, you know, if they feel like they want a snack, they'll grab it and sometimes they don't, but it's always there. And they've, uh, I've gotten thank you notes from them and they're really grateful. And I will leave little goodie bags in our mailbox because we have an actual mailbox at the end of our driveway. And um, she's she's been really appreciative. So. Welcome all of you. Let's dig into some news. So globally, uh, we hit 4 million cases uh, this weekend and the US is at 1.364 million. So 1,364,000. One New York's at 335,000. Uh, New Jersey's at 138. Massachusetts is really increasing. They're at 77,000. Illinois made a big, big jump. They're at 77,000 as well. So they've moved up. Um, sh California. So we have a lot of folks who tune in um, early in California. One of the things I want to highlight about California is they're at 66,000 cases. And the IHME, that's the institute that runs the modeling. Um, and and there, it's used by all the governors, all the you know federal government. It is kind of the clearinghouse of looking at where peaks and 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 decreases probably occur, they are um, showing that California is going up actually more than they expected. So California is exceeding the um, the numbers there. Partially, LA LA County is contributing to forty percent of the increase in cases. And if we look at it's been warmer, people are hitting the beaches. They've had to is closed on the beaches. 
And that might be part of the issue is the social distancing or lack thereof at the beach. And also there have been a lot of protesting in those uh, areas, beach closings and whatnot. So that might be contributing to that. Um, Pennsylvania is at 56,000, Michigan's at 47, Florida. Okay, Florida's moved up there at 40,000 cases, 40,596,000. In um, one week, they have seen an increase in deaths um, by, it was like 645 deaths and 60% of those deaths have been in nursing homes. I've reported multiple weeks now, Florida um, stopped. They, they told the nursing homes they didn't want them to report. Um, they were very much limiting access to getting, uh, you know, families knowing where the cases were, if your loved one was in, you know, a hot spot in a nursing home. And, you know, Florida, I grew up in St. Pete, which used to be known as, um, you know, God's waiting room. <laughs> A lot of older folks, it's changing, but there are still areas where there are retirees. And then a whole nother um, component that's been brought to light because of the attorney general in Palm Beach or Palm Beach County. One of the things that um, is concerning is that a lot of the folks that that winter in Florida, and maybe even they live there uh, permanently, but they might not be registered or considered residents. And so that's a whole other question mark is, are the are they being counted as Florida residents, Florida cases, or are they just going under the radar? So there's a lot of dispute. We might see those numbers go up significantly if they do report more accurately is what the kind of expectation is there. Um, for, I know we have a lot of folks on from Texas and comment down below, let me know where you're tuning in from and give me a big thumbs up on this video, please, if you are enjoying these shows. Um, Texas is at 38,000, Connecticut's at 33. And I wanted to make a note, Georgia is now at 33,000 cases. Since we started the reopening uh, about 10, 12 days, actually 14 days ago, this is officially two weeks ago uh, was the week that they started to do the reopening. Um, we've seen a 20% increase in cases. So that's very telling. And I wanna move to the world. Um, there are internationally clusters, little hot spots popping up here and there. Um, what were they considering the potential beginning of second waves as there's reopening? Now, South Korea only has 256 deaths. Okay, so that's very minor. We had the same reported case as them same day, and they were very swift, very quick to act. They did the you know temperature checking. They implemented a whole lot more testing per thousand than we have. Um, and they are under, they're undergoing a lockdown because they have seen a spike in cases. Um, and, and it has contributed to one super spreader. So, you know, South Korea started to loosen up their social distancing. They had opened up nightclubs and bars. Well, one individual went to a nightclub and in a matter of several days, he had contact with over a thousand people People. And um, that is what is causing <laughs> them to go into lockdown. So one person and, you know, in that type of setting, which is kind of crazy when you think a nightclub is you can't social distance in a nightclub or a bar. So, um, you know, that's very telling. We might see cases like that here. But the technology that I highlighted that Australia was rolling out, they're doing that. They're using phone apps and they're doing much more concentrated contact tracing so they can articulate very quickly that like Friday or Saturday, he tested positive. They can then look at where his whereabouts were and the connectivity of all these other people. And they instantly have notified over a thousand people that they came in contact with somebody who's tested positive. Um, so, but because of that and the technology, they're immediately able to react. So China also, um, I mentioned two, almost three weeks ago, they had one, an individual come from New York uh, back home, student moved, uh, you know, travel back home, a uh, very northern, northeast, let's see, yeah, northeast of um, Beijing. So way, way up uh, on the coastal kind of area. He, he ended up prompting a whole entire city lockdown. Well, Wuhan has another bout of cases. 
Um, but it's, it's in a residential area. So five or six members in one home have been uh, tested and they're actually starting to implement lockdowns there. There's another that they have a little clustering of cases and then also Germany is seeing an increase in, in cases. Oh, Pau is a new member. Yay, welcome to our, our um, uh, exclusive YouTube membership. I appreciate that. Um, so one of the things that I wanna highlight is that, um, you know, what, with the reopening, here in the US and you know, Georgia, uh, Sony M76, it's terrible, we're not okay here in Georgia. I know it is terrible. We're, we're not even really, again, they have not, we haven't hit the peak as we're seeing a 20% rise. The anticipation is it might move to 40. So, um, which makes it really, really scary. But the one thing to know, take us years to understand how this virus, and the disease it causes, how it uh, damages the body. So science and research is working really hard right now. And one of the things I want to caution all of you viewers, because I know you're really open to learning more and to being very cognizant about studies and information. Um, we just don't know enough. And this is because it's a novel state. It's a novel virus. It's something new. It is attacking the body in ways that we don't even recognize medically. Um, really unique, bizarre uh, scenarios and symptoms. And as we see more of these trends, we're starting to see more and more warnings and education for us as potential victims of this virus. Well, the other thing that we don't know a lot about is we don't know the virus and its interaction with medications uh, that we might be on or that might be prescribed to us or we might need in that hospital setting. Uh, we are learning potentially, and we'll see years to come, the role of the virus in our own genetics. So our own DNA, our own genetic makeup, is that playing a role? Is our lifestyle another factor? Is a diet another factor? Um, and even how is the distancing or social distancing, what's the impact? We just don't know those answers. And there's a lot of speculation. And, um, you know, with speculation, there there's the big question mark. And humans, we don't like that. Uncertainty makes us very uncomfortable. We want to identify. We want to pinpoint. We want to label. We want to categorize. We want to, you know, identify, uh, attack it, you know, whatever. But we just don't have that information. And so it is. it puts us all in this weird space of discomfort. So just know that that is normal to feel uncomfortable with a lack of information. That often leads, human nature gets angry. You know, we get angry, we get frustrated, we wanna blame somebody uh, for the lack of information. We wanna blame the scientists and governments and whatnot. But the reality is that it's just so new. We are learning as we go and medical providers are learning as we go. Also, all of the metrics and the epidemiology you know, much of it is statistics. Statistics is based on data. We are going to gather more and more data. We get more fine-tuned on those statistics like the modeling. So for instance, IMH, IHME, they put out a, a new modeling last week and I reported it. They bumped it from, you know, originally it was like 65, 68,000. Then they moved it. Okay. They looked at, okay, there's premature reopening based on the fact that all these gating measurements that the federal government put out to follow, the states aren't following, people are more you know, mobile. And they put together new modeling saying by uh, August 4th that we would see 135,000 cases, 30, 135 deaths, 135,000 deaths. So that was like the median, the middle of the range. Well, the modeling, because California bumping up more than expected, that modeling has now moved to 137 thousand deaths are expected by August 4th. Um, and this is a viral infection that is globally impacting the body. And so I've been reading more about just, you know, the symptoms, what else can I report to you that are, you know, just we're fine tuning and really honing in on, on what's going on. And at the end of the day, the disturbances are twofold. It disturbs, it disturbs globally the immune system. So there's this immune attack. 
And then it causes blood vessel inflammation. And the blood vessel inflammation in kids is where we're seeing heart failure and the low, uh, low oxygen to the blood, pumping disturbances, and low blood pressure. On the flip side, one of the underlying currents is it causes inflammation in the blood vessels in adults, and we see high blood pressure. Hypertension is an underlying concurrent, you know, current. It's an underlying factor in this disease pattern. And basically, we have a viral invasion that becomes this global infection in the body. So in that genetic transition and the you know RNA and the, the viral implanting itself in the human body, it initially starts as a respiratory virus and now it is being categorized also as a cardiovascular virus. And there's a lot of research now and a lot of information about how the virus operates. And so what science and research is trying to do, and again, we have to understand this is going to be years of understanding, but right now what we know is that the, the, the virus itself is it's a round bubble and it has these spikes. And the spikes of the, of, of the virus are what makes it so unique. These spikes apparently they implant into the human body and then it injects its own, uh, you know, genes into the human body, you know, mucosal lining of the sinuses, esophageal, whatever it might be. And then as that mutates, it may, it says make more of my virus cells. And then it, it roams through. One of the things that they're seeing is that the, the spike itself and the virus is very receptive or received by our ACE2 receptors. So our ACE2 receptors in the human body control blood pressure. It controls the vascular functionality. And what they've identified is that this virus itself, the spike, binds more tightly to the cells of the human body than some of the other viruses in that category, the coronavirus. And what they're identifying is our genetics, are our genetics a factor of when this spike that binds tightly to these ACE2 receptors, does that trigger something? Does it maybe turn on our genes? They don't know, but they're researching. And so there's a lot of, lot of question mark as to what, what all is involved. But now the, the global scope is it's not just respiratory, it's cardiovascular. The microclotting, the you know, stroke uh, victims that are in their late 20s, early 30s, perfectly fine, and yet they've got this vascular component. That's this virus, and that's the infection, and it becomes an infection in an inflammatory state of the cardiovascular channel. So today, I want to talk to you about four herbs that we're going to dig into further that can help at least minimize some of that inflammation, because if you decrease your inflammation globally you minimize just the extent of the overextended inflammatory state. So lowering inflammation anyway, regardless of a pandemic or autoimmunity, the root of all illness and disease and aging, the aging process is inflammation. It is what us as naturopaths, that's our core focus. How do we reduce the inflammation in your body? How do we keep your body from being so hot and and uh, inflamed, your cells hold water, they hold fluid, the edema or lymphedema, the lymphatic impact, that's our immune system. There's a whole big connection between inflammation and weakened or reduced immunity. Um, and anybody who's dealing with autoimmunity or any type of underlying degenerative disease, um, joint pain, arthritis, that's all inflammation. So you know, and I right now I'm dealing with seasonal allergies. It's really bad here. <laughs> and so I'm feeling a little inflamed. And I wanted to share with you in today's video four, four herbs that we will dig into that you can take that will help naturally balance the inflammatory state in your body. But I wanted to explain what, <clears throat> what we're seeing in terms of um, just globally, we're now, we're recognizing it's not just an acute respiratory syndrome. It's vascular inflammation, but it's also a, an infection. And some of the, some of the communication is that this may take years off people's lives. So they've recovered, but has that decreased their lifespan by what they're averaging is anywhere from 11 to 14, 11 years for women, 14 for men, because 
we don't know what's the long-term effect of a, a cardiovascular inflammatory state or an infection. I have a friend who had an infection and didn't know it, it attacked her heart. She started to have really, really low heart function. And it was a weird arrhythmia. She actually had to have a pacemaker put in in her early 40s. And that's not very common. So we might be seeing more and more vascular impact down the road from the damage of this inflammation. The other thing too is doctors, um, and, and there's this kind of interesting sh shift where, so for instance, like Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and uh, Boston General, the, the um, Mass General is in Boston. Mass Gen is one of the big facilities. That's where we saw all of those clinicians and a big subset of medical providers getting sick. So they were involved with a few other medical facilities in this research about the oxygen. So the big question mark is, you know, is, for instance, like New York, oh, Letitia, $10 super chat. Thank you. Yay. We have a live super chat from Letitia Martinez, $10. Thank you so much. She says, good morning. And smiley face and hearts. Mwah! Good morning. Happy Monday. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Um, so one of the things that they, they wanted to identify, New York's numbers of folks who are on ventilation and their survival after or, uh, you know, being on ventilation, intubation, receiving oxygen, it was not great. Only 20% would actually come through that. And the question mark was why? Why is this happening? Why is ventilation, which should be and is known as the protocol, why is it not effective? And so they started to look at like boss, you know, in Boston, Mass Gen has high rates. And then uh, Beth Israel, Israel Deaconess, there's Oshner down in Louisiana. Well, it's interesting, the facilities that are switching the methodology. And the other thing too, is we have a shortage in ventilation. They were switching the methodology, putting on people on BPAP and CPAPs. They were doing a, 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 a a cannula of, of oxygen. So they'd have, you know, a little oxygen flow in the nose, they'd turn it up to the highest range. And also putting people on their tummies to uh, enhance the oxygen flow, but also help drain the, the lungs, they're identifying the survival rates better, and people are not dying, it actually kind of flipped it the other way. So the interesting part here is, when I was reading, the head of pulmonology at Mass General is not deviating from the standard protocol of treating folks that have low oxygen levels, and their numbers might be different. Um, and that also might be one of the contributing factors to the mortality rate is potentially these protocols. As science shows us more about the way this virus integrates into our body, and then potentially as we learn more about diet, lifestyle, and genes, genetics, which those are all preventative and we can address those. I mean, at the end of the day, our genes are what they are, but we have certain factors that turn, that trigger, we can turn genes on and off. And so inflammation can be one of those factors that can turn things on or off. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I do also wanna highlight that there are scientists that are looking at the genomes of this particular SARS-CoV-2. And they've isolated 5,349 genomes. So these little gene sequences. And what they're monitoring is the spike mutation. This is, I mean, this gets like so intricate, but I, it's fascinating to me. So I'm just gonna share it with you guys. So, you know, the virus is this round little bubble, of, you know, round cell, and it has these spikes. And uh, these spikes are what makes it so powerful. It sticks in and it's tight, and then it pushes in it, it's the sequencing that says to the body to manufacture. So it attacks our cells and it manufactures more of itself. That's what viruses do. And they do exist, just by the way. For anybody who you feel oh, you want to email me, viruses don't exist, that is BS. <laughs> so this virus, the strength of this spike is what they're looking at. They're looking at the mutation of the virus, because we know viruses mutate and change as they go through human bodies. What they've identified is there have been two mutations of the spike. 
And this plays a big role when we're looking at not just antibody testing, but more importantly, if we are going to look at what drugs counteract the mutated spike, and then also any type of vaccine uh, study. Because if we're gonna target the type of mutation, the mutated, and this is just like the flu, and, and that's why sometimes the efficacy of flu vaccines are not great because it's a moving target, viruses mutate, and we it's often a guess. So this, identify the identification and monitoring of these spike mutations is critical. And they've seen that the two mutations, one of the spike changes, they've seen it in 788 of the case, cases. So they did a sample size of less than 6,000 in this data poll. And 788 had one spike mutation. And then th there were 32 that had the second. And that's very congruent with the kind of growth and evolution uh, and mutation of a virus. But that's very telling. It is... Um, it's, it, it's intuitive and it is surviving in our body and it is adapting and changing. And that is what science will be looking at. So I put that out there. I thought that was really fascinating, some of that re research. Um, and, and it plays really well into the topic today about four herbs that are potent and powerful at helping you reduce your inflammation levels in your body. So I wanna dig through these. Um, you know, briefly here, but I also want to address some of you guys. Um, let's see. Um, and I'm so glad Lori, we had Lori P on Saturday, recommend her friend Betty join us on Facebook. Um, and she was saying that her sister had um, passed on a ventilator and it's just, it's so, it's so impactful in so many different ways. And you know, in, if we can lower our and our friends, our family members inflammation levels, it, it just sets us up to be healthier individuals, our cells are healthier, we're less prone to illness and disease. So let's, let's dig into you herb number one, I this, honestly, this is one of my favorite herbs, it doesn't get a lot of um, street credibility. But it is been around for hundreds of years. And in fact, it is the core uh, herbal derivative of aspirin. Okay. So the herb that I love to lower inflammation is called white willow bark and white willow bark is pretty amazing. So, you know, scientists isolate it and they, they take one part of the white willow bark and that's become what we know as aspirin. That's the pain reliever. The aspect that they forget and did not isolate is the power and potency of white willow bark. White willow bark is an anti-inflammatory. And so if you deal with arthritic pain, uh, autoimmune related pain, which lupus, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, even Sjogren's, uh, Hashimoto's, it's not uncommon for folks to even feel pain in the neck. It is very powerful at lowering inflammation levels, but also reducing the pain level. So nature, made that to be a double whammy. And so when we take white willow bark in its natural form, and you can take this in a capsule or a liquid, um, and by the way, YouTube, I have all four of these in one supplement. So you don't have to run out and buy all of them separately. You can grab them all individually. Um, and the link's down below. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that. But white willow bark, is potent. So instead of aspirin or, you know, any of the pain relievers, my first go-to is always white willow bark. And it is both an anti-inflammatory, which in many cases, the pain comes from inflammation. So masking the pain doesn't really resolve the cause, which is inflammation. Um, and, you know, especially if we're dealing with, let's say an injury, you know, an injury, there might be a muscle tear, a ligament, tendon tear, or just an overexertion that ends up causing inflammation. The inflammation will then press on the nerves or nerve bundles, and then we have this pain registration, and then sometimes people get stuck in these pain loops. Well, the inflammatory state that kicks off the pain can be lowered by white willow bark. And then white willow bark also addresses the pain. So it, it's, it's a double whammy. I love it, love, love, love. So Tawana says, I have white willow bark. Is all willow good to use? Um, I don't know what all willow means, but like white willow bark is what you want to be looking for. Um, very, very powerful. Okay, so the other thing, the second thing 
um, that is potent. And again, when you couple all these up together, they're extremely potent. The other one is turmeric. So you guys know I love putting turmeric in pretty much everything. Um, this is a spice that I just don't think we can get enough of. It is uh, very pro anti-inflammatory. It's also a very good lymphatic motivator. And so one of the things when we look at inflammation, inflammation is swelling. And because we can't always see what inflammation looks like inside, it's hard to mentally visualize it. But if you think about a lot of times an inflammatory area, like let's say inflammation of the knee, you can actually see a bubble or pocket of fluid. Inflammation is a swelling of tissue. And so this, it's like a sponge, so the tissue swells. And like in sinuses, you can kind of notate like the passages kind of get a little, little tighter, harder to breathe, a little bit more mucus production. That swelling directly impacts the lymphatic system. So when we take turmeric, we reduce the inflammation. We reduce the inflammation levels, but we also promote the lymphatic flow to get that fluid and inflammation moving and evacuating out of the body. So turmeric is fantastic for uh, any, any inflammatory state. And if you deal with pain, if you deal with inflammation, swelling, turmeric needs to be in your daily diet. And, and this spice, I mean, this is, people encapsulate this. This is an organic, you know, I got this simply organic the other day because I was running low. But I use turmeric a lot in cooking. You can sprinkle it on vegetables, put it in sauce. I'll make my eggs with it. You know, if we do scrambled eggs, um, it's a beautiful orange color. And that orange, the orange aspect to it, the, the properties, that's what makes it so potent. So I just love turmeric as an inflammatory, anti-inflammatory. Now, my third is you can consume this in food. Um, so definitely consider if you guys can tolerate this food group, you know, for sure you want to have this in your routine, not necessarily every day. I'm not a big fan of eating, consuming foods every day. Um, but what I recommend is like, you know, every third day consuming these foods, also drinking the juice. But my third is bromelain. Bromelain is a particular type of potent chemical that comes out of pineapple. So pineapples have a high, high degree of bromelain. And so this particular type of um, extract is extremely potent at, it's like it lower, it's like a Pac-Man when it comes to inflammation. It just goes in and it just metabolizes the inflammation. It is very, very powerful at moving fluid throughout the body. So let's say, and I know a lot of you have follow me because of my lymphatic work. Let's say you have lymphedema or you have some swelling of your feet or ankles or even puffiness in and around your body. You just feel like I'm, I'm holding excess fluid. Bromelain, pineapple juice will flush that area. I, I do a lot of work with post-surgical cases elective, non-elective, you know, cancer, uh, all different types of cancer cases to, you know, appendix removals to organ glandular removal to folks that are, you know, replacing joints and hips and things like that. Um, the post-surgical impact of bromelain will reduce the bruising. So one of the things that we will do is they get on, I have this whole pre and post protocol. It's actually, I think it's 14 or 18 weeks. It's a very extensive program, um, but it's a digital download that all of my patients buy online and they download it. And it is a prep to surgery and then basically four months after surgery. And it breaks down like, you know, day of surgery, a few days after surgery, a week after, and so on, you know, for a lot of my Brazilian butt lifts and my um, liposuction patients. And I do, I do have a lot of those because I get referred to by um, plastic surgeons in the lymphatic world, those folks really, really notice significant benefits when they add bromelain. Now, it's not just for bruising or swelling. It has a key, key role in reducing inflammation within the body. And the bromelain itself is the potent force in a, a pineapple. 
Um, and so if you ate a third or quarter of a pineapple in a setting, you're going to get the degree of bromelain you need. Now, not everybody does that. I know some people who feel like they get canker sores or it's too, you know, a little acidic, too intense. Um, this is very, very powerful at really, really reducing uh, the degree of swelling and inflammation. And we see this swelling and, re and, and inflammation reduction in the digestive process. So if you have any IBS, um, even we will notice some changes in the inter interstitial cystitis or just even stomach related inflammation, very, very powerful. Um, so I, I love bromelain and bromelain is isolated but obviously you guys know I'm always food first. So when you can eat it, eat it and then supplement and then, you know, kind of do that combination. But pineapple juice, very potent. I will tell you when I kind of look at the genetic, um, not genetic, but the chemistry makeup of blood types, blood type O really does well. Uh, pineapple and pineapple juice is in the um kind of highly recommended essential category of juices. And it keeps us low on the inflammatory level. So O's can be in, nat in kind of natural state and they can be more inflamed. Um, so the pineapple juice will lower the inflammation levels. Um, Pau says, I eat pineapples every day. I learned this from my sweet grand aunt who died at the age of 99 eating pineapple and papaya every day. Yeah, so great. Can you still eat pineapple with blood sugar issues? Excellent question, Shannon. So one of the things with pineapple, and this is where, uh, you know, fruits get a bad rap <laughs> when it comes to blood sugar levels. When a fruit or any type of food has a high degree of fiber, and you look at pineapple when you cut it, there's a lot of fiber. Um, you're better off eating the full pineapple with a fiber than you are drinking a juice. Um, so you decrease the absorption of sugar in a diet when it's rich and higher in fiber content. So just know to slow sugar absorption, higher fiber slows that process down. Fiber takes a little bit more time to digest and then that slows down the degree of sugar. So the fructose that would be in a pineapple juice is different than, it's, it's going to, it, it would be the same level, but it's different in terms of how it's digested. So with the actual slice of pineapple, chewing it, you know, really well, chewing, you know, that everything begins in the mouth. You got to chew it right. But that is, that's critical in slowing down that, that sugar absorption. Um, can you put it in everything or just what you mentioned? Are you recommending Letitia, the turmeric? You can put turmeric in a lot of stuff. Um, so Vicky says taking inflame X. So there's a product that I've recommended down below. It has all of these. She says when taking flame inflame X is the dosage the same, no matter how much you weigh. So that's an excellent question. What I do, I actually tailor, uh, for a lot of my patients inflame X. Um, and let me see, I'm going to pull it up here. Um, so a, a total four capsules are what they recommend all throughout, you know, every day. They recommend two twice a day, usually with food. And so you're going to be, end up getting uh, about 550 milligrams of white willow bark and 500 turmeric, 500 bromelain. You don't need a whole lot. And the potency of all of this together is very powerful in terms of they have synergies in the reduction. They target a lot of different anti-inflammatory um factors we want to address and lowers collectively the inflammatory response in the body. So if somebody's extremely inflamed and what, what I, what we look at, we actually look at your inflammatory markers. So any of you who maybe have a, um, a, a rheumatoid arthritis, you know, uh, not rheumatoid arthritis, but if you have a, uh, rheumatoid, a rheumatologist, they generally run your ANA level. So they'll run your inflammatory markers. So it's a blood test. Um, we also run that, you know, we can get the, infl and the antibody testing so we can get an identity of if there's inflammation within the thyroid. So those antibody tests are very potent um, as well as looking at your, um, your inflammatory markers. That is what we use. So without really identifying and quantifying, the daily dose is, is fine. I always say start something slow 
and see how your body reacts. And then if you notice like what will happen um, and I'll get into the fourth one as well, but what will happen when you, when you're adding any one or all four of these herbs, because inflammation is fluid oriented, it is a swelling, if you will, an accumulation of fluid and tissue, and it causes redness, it causes the swelling, you are going to get fluid flushing via the lymphatic system. So it promotes lymphatic flow. The expectation when it's working is you're going to be urinating more. So the volume increases and the frequency increases. Totally normal. And the expectation too, because we're moving fluid in the lymphatic system, you will note that maybe there's an odor or a little discoloration because the lymphatic system is our garbage disposal system. It gets junk out of the body, it flushes it through the system and toxic matter, junk, gunk, debris, it exits via the lymphatics. So all of that comes out and flows out the kidneys, the bladder, and, and flushes out of the body. So I hope that is helpful. Um, yes, Dorothy, I do work with cancer patients. Um, the enzymes you're talking about too. Yes, yeah, so bromelain is an enzyme. Um, pineapple is the fruit where you have the highest potency of bromelain. So food first, pineapple, 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 lots of it whole, fresh. And here's a trick if you guys are like us and you grow and you might live in an area where you could accommodate pineapple, you can cut off the top of pineapple, stick it in the ground and it will grow. And I actually grew up, my mom would do that with basically every pineapple we ate and we had pineapples pretty much all the time. Um, and some pineapples will give you two or three fruit uh, depending on how prolific it is. Um, so can we take more than the daily dose? Yes, you absolutely can take the daily dose. Um, the big factors here because of all of the aspects in the supplement it can thin the blood. So if you are taking warfarin or any of those other medications, talk with your doctor first, talk with your pharmacist, because I don't know your cases. I can't recommend specifically and individually, but definitely you can go outside of the range that it's recommending. Okay, so let's dig into number four. Number four is one of my favorites. It is ginger. You guys probably guessed this if you've watched me quite a bit. For all of my lymphatic patients and anybody with any inflammatory state, I always recommend ginger, ginger tea, ginger root. I totally forgot to grab my ginger root in the fridge, but ginger tea, they come in tea bags. I love traditional medicinals. It's one of my favorites. They actually have a Tulsi, which is the holy basil. That's a stress reliever. And they have a ginger combined as a tea. And it's so fantastic. And I'll write that down. I'll make sure I add the Tulsi uh, so you guys can grab that. Um, but ginger, ginger is an anti-inflammatory. It particularly promotes uh, a reduction in bacteria. So it is antibacterial as well. Um, it is going to be an astringent. It'll clear and cleanse any excess fluid floating in and around any tissues. So if you deal with chronic sinusitis or sinus headaches or you know, congestion in your throat, even bronchial inflammation. When you consume ginger, either, you know, as a root, you can do it pickled, you can, you know, um, consume it fresh, although it's pretty potent. I, I love boiling fresh ginger. That's how I make my teas. I use the fresh when I can. Um, and it is very, very potent in terms of moving excess fluid. So this is a big, big lymph motivator, but very powerful at also stabilizing blood sugar levels. Ginger doesn't get billed for this, but one of the things that it does is if you have blood sugar imbalances, which diabetes is also a major undercurrent uh, in this virus, it's one of the major um, uh, health risks, if you will, same with high blood pressure. Um, and high blood pressure is often inflammation related as well. What we, what we do with ginger, ginger will help balance blood sugar levels. And I see lots of concerns about folks who are insulin resistant, so you don't eat fruit. Um, I take bromelain and turmeric. I'll start the ginger. Um, so the first one was white willow bark. Um, so, uh, oh, good. Pat, you got enormous organic garlic in the mail. Oh, how'd you get it in the mail? Mm, I love garlic. 
Um, I actually, uh, I got some on my Aldi haul. I actually forgot to put that in the, the video, but I got, I'm, I'm going to grow, I think 30 or 40 of them. <laughs> and they're, they're really good apparently in roses. So I'm going to put some garlic in my roses, but on the note of ginger, ginger is pretty darn spectacular. And, um, when we put all these four together, so the four, let me just quickly review. We have white willow bark. We have turmeric. We have bromelain. That's an enzyme that comes out of papayas or not papayas, pineapple, bromelain. And then we pair it up with ginger. Those four become extremely powerful anti-inflammatory herbs. It's a, it's a cocktail, if you will, of anti-inflammatory properties. And collectively, these are, have been all put together by uh, this one brand that I use. It's where I, I use the brand is they put out my vitamin D that I use and take on the daily. But the, um, the brand and the name of the product is called Inflame X. There's a link down below. Instagram, if you guys want the links, DM me and I will message you. Um, we've, we've had an influx of messages, emails, and so we're trying to manage that. Um, the other thing I want to note about Darn YouTube, they now have started just pulling some of my content about this virus. And I've, I haven't been backing up my live show. So I'm going to back them all up today. If any of them get pulled, I'm just going to post them either to my Vimeo account or over on Facebook. Facebook doesn't seem to be censoring as much, but they pulled my UV for COVID-19 video. That was such a great video. I was so bummed. Um, luckily, I haven't gotten any strikes because of it. They're just deleting it. And I think part of that, um, just so you guys are aware, there. oh, Stephanie, we've got a new member. Yay, Stephanie, welcome. Um one of the things that is is triggering this is that stupid pandemic pandemic uh, document. It was a trailer, a completely unfounded. Like the science on it is just, you know, critically thinking and looking at the research. It's really, really off, and it's an unfortunate, uh, it's an unfortunate timing of this because people are going to be taking this for real. Um, but I've dug into, I've spent a lot of time, uh, over the last like six days researching this and digging in a lot of holes in, in the, the trailer and the storyline and all that. But because of that and the massive like freak out over this, they, YouTube is now censoring even more COVID-19 coronavirus content. So that may uh, impact our channel. It might impact my daily live shows. I don't know. I'm just anticipating but somebody was like, I went to watch that and it's deleted. And then I logged in and saw on Google, I got a message on, um, what was it? On Saturday. So they pulled it Saturday. Um, so just know we're going to keep plugging away. I'll keep pushing out content. My goal is to start also editing some of the smaller versions so that we could um, uh, just have the kind of content focused as well in the event they do do this. Um, but you know, I got around the set, the demonetization somehow I have gotten past that, but then now they're just pulling. So I still have to, um, I still actually have to appeal it and YouTube's buffering now. So sorry, YouTube, they buffered. Um, so I'm appealing that it's this whole process. It'll take probably weeks, but at any rate, you know, today's topic specifically, I felt was necessary for us to dig into herbals that combat inflammatory levels in the body. And if you're curious more about inflammation, symptoms of it, I actually have several videos that I have produced here on YouTube that dig further into this. I even talk about, I have a playlist. I have an, it's an anti-inflammatory playlist. Actually, let me see if I can grab that for you guys really fast. Um, but let me see, let me go over here. Um, I have an anti-inflammatory uh, diet related, um, video. I also actually, I think I have two or three of those. Um, I've hosted live shows on Facebook about them. Well, but the inflammation I'm dealing with is, is outside. So it's environmental, it's allergy related. Um, but the, let me see let me go to my inflame. Let me see if I can pull up the, I'll, I'll try it for you too. I'll try and, um, yeah. Uh, let's see. I have a how to reduce inflammation in your body. I have a whole entire playlist and I'm going to copy that. 
before it starts playing. Um, okay, so I'm gonna post for all of you in the comment box below. Oh, I see 2009 BA, yay, she's a new member. We've got a lot of new members today. Welcome everybody. And Leticia, thanks for that live super chat. I'm so grateful. So link um, in the live chat, and I'll link it also in the replay of this. Um, you guys can watch, I think it's, it looks like there's six videos in my playlist about anti, you know, really how to reduce inflammation levels in the body. So some of it's food, some of it's environmental, some of it's physiological, some it's genes. We have certain genes that, you know, get turned on or triggered. So we have to look at all different layers and levels of the inflammation within the body. But no, at the end of the day, inflammation is the root of a lot of disease and imbalance that exists. And if you, if you're able to target and address inflammation, what it's looking like, and again, this is quite speculative, so I'm not making any substantial, you know, statement on this. And see my little inflammation, my nose is running. Um, one of the things that is, I think, most important is if you have underlying health concerns and you're nervous about how would the virus impact that, if you can lower and keep your inflammation levels as balanced and as low as they can be, you're keeping your cells healthier, you are improving your immune state, you're, you're just in a, it's, it levels the ground. So for folks that don't lower inflammation, they're already inflamed. And then you add on COVID and we know it's inflammation of the lung tissue. It affects all of these different um, organs and glands. And actually, I printed out some, I printed out a list and I wanted to read it to you. So some of the systems that inflammation from this virus affects, affects the brain. We have neurological challenges. We see strokes and blood clots in the brain. Eyes, pink eye, that's an inflammation, redness of the eye. The nose, there is the loss of smell and taste. Um, and that is inflammation in the area where the nerve registers that. There's blood related inflammation. So the um, what they know is the virus attacks, the lining of blood vessels, the gastrointestinal system, there's inflammation that causes vomiting and diarrhea in some people. The lungs, people get clots, the air sacs of the lungs get inflamed. So there's definitely that inflammation that hampers breathing, it lowers the oxygen levels. Okay, Jefferson, you're a new member, welcome, yay. Um, the heart, the other thing that happens with the heart is it weakens the heart muscle itself. And then it causes arrhythmias and people will have heart attacks because of the small clots. The kidneys get damaged. The structure that filter the waste from the blood actually require dialysis. So the kidney, long-term kidney Im impact. And then the skin they're, skin, they're seeing the COVID toes, the rash, the children that have these like high like purple reddish rashes. That rash, the redness is the blood vessel inflammation. So it, it registers as red. And I showed pictures last week of some of the babies. Um, I think I showed pictures, but they're really red skin. I mean, it is as red as my tape and splotches. It looks like hives, but it's not. It's the vascular inflammation uh, just underneath the skin. And then also the immune system. There's widespread overwhelming inflammation and the overactivity of the immune system ends up attacking healthy tissue. So, oh, Lori, we've got all these new members. Yay, welcome, welcome. Actually, next week, next weekend, we're gonna do a live uh, member chat. So YouTube has a private, I don't know, some thing they started about almost two years, almost a year and a half ago. Um, it's a private YouTube community member. And so people pay for, a, a, I think it's $4.99 is what we have ours listed as. Um, and you gain access to additional video and, and live chats and things like that. So um, we have a lot of new members. Yay, thank you all. So what the key thing that's going on and also with young children, we're seeing the, um, they've labeled it. There's a new label. Um, I reported about this the other day. The Pediatric Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome. That's the new title for how it affects children. And there were over 85 cases 
of children that show this very rare inflammatory state that causes cardiac complications. So inflammation is an underlying factor in all of the different systems that are being impacted. So we lower inflammation levels, we put our systems at a better state, they're healthier, the cells are healthier. Um, and that makes us healthier. So that is our, our, our topic today. I'm very excited to share that with you. Um, June says when my chiropractor does nutrition response testing, it always shows inflammation and or damage. It's very common. Um, oh, Pow. So she wants to know what is the name of the plant in the blue plant planter? That thing. That's a peace lily. It's a variegated peace lily. My office is a little bit of a disaster. Gabriel, oh, Instagram. I can't even bring you over there to show you. Gabriel has set up. So this right here, the setup, he plays drums now. It's my new way of like getting rid of energy for him inside because it was rainy and cold over the weekend. Um, he gets up. That's my old chair that I used to uh, use in my office in Florida to work on people. It's very ergonomic, but he gets on there and he's like with spatula. So I've ordered the kid a drum sticks. <laughs> Brian's nervous. That's going to turn into a drum set, but I think he has some skills. He has some internal rhythm. Uh, that's pretty cool. So anyway, Gabriel was giving me uh, a concert pretty much every day and then asked me to video him because he was like, mommy, turn your camera on. <laughs> So kids nowadays with technology, it's so amazing. Um, I keep telling him he's going to take over the business when he gets older, or at least when he's like 10, he'll probably help me with my social media. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's a little tip about my son and Mother's Day was great yesterday. I hope I look rested. I feel very rested. Um, but anyway, Peace Lily is very good. The reason I have the Peace Lily um, and I have a lot of plants in my office, this Peace Lily is not doing great. I, I, I need to change it out. I don't think the dirt's the right dirt. Um, but uh, plants are, peace lily particularly gives a lot of oxygen off. And so it's a good air cleanser. And that's another thing too, you know, I would look at and I've listed some items in your home. You know, we have the salt lamp that I always recommend, the UV uh, lamps, the UV air filter. I don't have mine in here um, today, but very, very powerful. So, oh, you guys are so cute. Yeah, Gabriel, he is quite musical and I love it. So uh, he's approaching the last 10 days of, of fake school. And I told him, well, honey, fake school is going to get, you know, we're continuing with school because I feel like we've already lost some of the momentum he was getting in writing. And so um, I've got a mommy school plan set up for him. Um, but yeah, so anyway. This was the topic today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We had a lot of folks on here. So I'm, I'm very encouraged by how many of you uh, joined me this morning, which I want to thank you. So please hit the like button, hit the share button, uh, Instagram, give me a like a screenshot and share to your stories. If you can, please, that helps me grow the Instagram. I actually am really close. I think we're 12 or uh, 120 away from, um, moving to 10,000 followers on Instagram. Once that happens, I have this ability to swipe you off to a URL. So that will be great for all of you who are like, I want the link for whatever. I can just, you know, do a photo and link you to whatever the product. So, um, but yeah, so thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, follow me on Instagram. You can catch me at natural health resources. So for all of you on YouTube, I hope you'll follow over there. I post a lot of stories um, today, we're going to make mommy cookies. Uh, again, we're out of mommy cookies. And uh, so I hope all of you had a wonderful Mother's Day. I hope, you have, I hope all of you have a wonderful Monday. Tune in tomorrow. More news, more information. And I will see you guys then. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Bye. Thanks, YouTube. And thank you to all of our new members. I'm so excited. Leticia, you're so wonderful for the $10 Super Chat. That totally made my morning. What a great way to kick off our day. So welcome Stephanie and Pow and IC 2009 and Kay Jefferson and Lori Prasha. Thank you so much for joining our community. So very exciting and uh, look for more details on the community tab. And you guys, when you're private members, you can scroll through, you'll see additional content there. So thanks everybody. Have a great day. Bye. See you later.